make it this afternoon. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jessica Deary, and I'm a, uh, a member of Drupal for Gov, which is uh, a nonprofit organization who's dedicated to supporting those that work in government, either directly as government employees or those that support government agencies um, to uh, continue to invest and learn about open source technology. So you may have heard of Drupal for Gov um, through Drupal GovCon. It's our largest event. We hold it every summer. Um, we have around 900 attendees uh, at NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. It's three full days full of sessions and training um, and just uh, lots of uh, really good networking opportunities. So our dates for 2019 are out there. We will be at NIH again. And our dates are July 24th through the 26th. So mark your calendars. Um, you should expect to see session submission and registration open up um, in the early spring of 2019. In addition, um, we also host these monthly webinars. We do them on the third Thursday of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. This is our last webinar for 2018. Uh, the December edition tends to be a little too close to the holidays, so we'll be picking them up in January. We are still putting together our 2019 webinar schedule, so if you yourself have an idea of something that you would like to present or that you've seen somewhere else that you think our audience would like, please reach out and let us know. Uh, I'll post some, some links and some email contact info into the chat box in just a few minutes as ways that you can reach us and help us put together our 2019 webinar schedule. So let me go ahead and just take a minute to introduce our speakers today. We have Amy June with us. She is the Drupal Community Lead at Hook42. She's one of Drupal's top 20 contributors and manages most of the contributions that Hook42 makes to different Drupal projects. We also have Jonathan with us. He's a senior Drupal developer at Hook42, and he's both a Drupal and WordPress developer and maintains uh, several different open source modules and plugins uh, for both of those types of systems. So thank you both for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to Amy, June, and Jonathan. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so we're going to get started with Drupal contributions today. Um, we're going to we're going to go over a lot. Um, it's going to seem a little bit out of order, but we kind of circle back to things. So just have patience. So who are we? We are, um, well, I am Amy June. That's title camel case Amy June, and I'm the Drupal community lead at Hook42. I went through Drupal Easy Academy and learned some Drupal, but I want to clarify that I am not a coder, um, but I am a top contributor to Drupal. So the premise of a lot of this is if I can do it, you can do it. In a previous life, I was a nurse, and right now I help organize Ally Talks, which is a virtual um, accessibility meetup every month. And I'm Jonathan Daggerhart. I am a developer at Hook42. Mostly PHP and JavaScript is where I focus. And I like working in many CMSs, Drupal, WordPress, a little bit of backdrop. And <clears throat> I have a blog at daggerhart.com. Check it out. And then who are you? Um, you are project managers, your operational managers, your client support, your product or agency owners, and maybe even you're a coder. But more importantly, you are anyone and everyone. You are community members looking to get involved with contributing back to the Drupal project. And um, maybe you just don't know how. Maybe, you know, you just need those first steps because sometimes um, beginning is the hardest step so um, and what are we doing today we're gonna just have a, like a discussion we're gonna talk about tools of the trade and then we are going to do a live demo of the issue queue process so that will be a lot of fun and let's see why do we contribute well well we contribute because why not um, Dries has this blog post out there from the beginning that says collaboration rather than competition. And I think that's a really good um, model. There's plenty of benefits to contributing. Um, you get street cred for you and your organization. Each time you contribute, you get a little tick on your Drupal.org profile. 
you can learn how to code organically. Um, when you make mistakes, repatching helps remind us what mistakes not to make again. Um, and in the tech industry, using and contributing the open source is seen as good corporate citizenships. And it's also kind of a firm social responsibility. So in addition to gaining um, some competitive advantage, companies that pay employees to contribute are improving their image and potentially their ability to recruit more talent. And then, of course, the smaller tasks help people increase confidence and gain, gain experience, which in turn leads to more contributions. Code is really important, but so are all the other parts of contributing back to Drupal. And contributing really does help folks become better developers. And then a more polished Drupal, of course, leads to a better overall experience for everybody. And then, of course, there are lots of ways to contribute. There's translations, there's um, making your own themes and modules, there's contributing to documentation, there's mentoring, there's testing and breaking code. And you don't have to be a coder or a developer to get back to the project. Let's see, some of the tools of the trade we're going to go over. We're going to briefly talk about local Drupal environments, but only briefly because you don't really need those to start contributing. And sometimes that's one of the biggest barriers to entry. We're going to talk a little bit about command line and get client. We're going to talk about Dreaditor, and we're going to talk about Simply Test Me. So the Drupal issue queue. I'm assuming everyone's seen the Drupal issue queue. It's a little scary at first. Um, the there's different ways you can search the issue queue. Um, sorry for the small picture. You can search by project. You can search by priority. There's an advanced search function. As you get more into the issue queue, you can um, search by what your passion is, whether it be like accessibility or out of the box, that sort of thing. It's color coded according to what the status is. You know, you can see how many followers, you can see how many comments are made, you can see how old the issue is. So it's pretty, um, it's a good idea to kind of look at the issue queue before you start just so you can kind of acquaint yourself with it. And then, let's see, local Drupal environment. There are so many to choose from. And Jonathan's going to talk a little bit more about this. Yes, yeah, so the basic, the basic thing you need to understand about a local Drupal in, environment is why you might need it and what it is. The reason you would need a local environment is if you're writing code and you want to uh, you want to test that code on your computer as opposed to maybe on a live website somewhere on the internet. The, the main part of a development environment or really any hosted Drupal environment is the quote AMP stack. And that's a acronym for, for three specific tools. That stands for the A is Apache, which, which is what, which is what serves a website from the internet. This is what will send a website's HTML to your browser. VM is MySQL, which is a database where you store your content for the website or maybe your users or any, any sort of dynamic information like that. And the P is, of course, PHP, which is the programming language that many popular projects are written in. Specifically, Drupal uses PHP. So there's a number of these that come sort of pre-built and pre-configured for you. The most popular that uh, you'll find, and that's sort of the easiest to get started with by far for Drupal development are MAMP, which if you're using a Mac, that basically stands for Macintosh AMP. And uh, there, there are other similars for like if you're on a Windows computer, there's one called XAMP, starting with XAMP. But also there are some of these development environments that come wholly packaged as far and sort of run as its own program on your computer as opposed to installing Apache and installing MySQL. And those consist of the Acquia Dev Desktop, which is a tool that's very easy to download and get started building Drupal sites with. And these additional these additional projects listed on the left are 
are much more flexible as far as if you want to get sort of down in, into a real development workflow where you might be working on dozens of sites, then you want to look at a tool like Lando, DDEV, Doxel, or the Drupal VM. These are all these are all for sort of professional or if you just want to see what a professional development environment looks like for your local computer. But generally, they'll all be running those same three things, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Now, as a non-coder, I don't typically use a local environment, and my role at Hook42 is contributing back to the project, so I work on lots of projects every day. So for me, Simply Test Me is a great tool because it's a non-local Drupal environment. It's a website that spins up the, the, the Drupal instance for you, um, especially when you're just testing a module or trying to break something. Um, there, it eliminates one of the barriers to entry because sometimes there's the learning curve of setting up a local and also the time it takes to set up a local. So simply test me. Um, like I said, it's just, it's, there's no local setup required. Um, you can evaluate modules and themes and their dependencies. It right now supports both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. And we'll talk about Dreaditor a little bit later, but simply test me. Um, there's a button that Dreaditor provides in the issue queue that you can spin up a patch with simply test me like with the push of a button. So that's pretty spectacular. And then um, this is the simply test me side site. So you just simply enter a project name, the version you want to test. You open up the additional options tab. If you want to test additional projects, like say you need to create some content. So you would maybe plug in the devel module. If you want to apply patches, you find the URL and you can add a patch and then you just click launch sandbox. And that's all it takes to spin up a local environment. It maybe takes one or two minutes and then you have a site ready to go. And then um, Dreaditor will insert a simply test me button into the issue queue. So when you go into a specific issue, Dreaditor will provide a review button and a simply test me button. And what you do is you just click that simply test me button. Dreaditor will auto populate your project, the, the version you want and the patch URL. So that is super easy. Doesn't take more than a second to spin that up. And then going full circle and talking about Dreaditor, Dreaditor has one sole purpose. It's a Drupal editor and it's a browser extension. Now, Jonathan found it on Firefox. Um, I use Chrome and you can sometimes find it on Safari. There's a caveat to Dreaditor is sometimes, well, it's not maintained by Drupal.org. So there's one developer out there that always likes to say, the forecast of Dreaditor is cloudy with the chance of deprecation. So I love the tool and I promote it and I really would wish that they would keep this tool. So the more I promote it, the more people use it and the more chances are that it will stay in the issue queue. And what it does is it provides a template when you're creating an issue, it will highlight code changes, it will highlight special characters like tabs and carriage returns. It will highlight empty spaces. It provides a unique interface when you want to make comments on the patch that you're reviewing. And then again, it provides a simply test me button that will automatically um, be added to all the patches on Drupal.org. So this, these are two, these are both the same patch. One of them, the one with all the white, is without Dreaditor. As you can see, it's really hard to read. There's pluses and minus, there's no highlighting. But that same patch, when you spin it up with Dreaditor, it will highlight the lines that were added. It will highlight the lines that were taken away. So it just makes the overall experience a little bit better. It also highlights the empty spaces and special characters with red. So we all know that coding standards, you don't want special characters like the tab, and you don't want empty spaces at the end of your line. 
So if we think back to that first slide where the whole, what we saw was all white, it's really hard to see those empty spaces. So this is one of the, the I think the best benefits of Dreaditor. And also when you're creating an issue, there's an insert template button, which I don't always use when I'm working on contrib projects, but I definitely always use it when I'm writing a core issue. There's also an insert tasks button. And I've been contributing to Drupal for two years and it's never worked. So if you wanna use that and it doesn't work, that is a known bug. And then when you, open up your patch to review and you want to make a comment, you simply click on the line and this user interface will open up where you can type in your comment, hit save and paste, and it automatically appears in the comment for the issue. This was a slide I added. So I just want to specify when I was looking for Dreaditor, it was sort of a pain and here's a typo here on the right basically i just recommend searching specifically dreaditor for your browser this should say dreaditor for firefox on the right but importantly dreaditor.org was an old url that someone registered for this project a long time ago and let lapse and is now a spam site so never at dreaditor.org <laughs> All right, so let's talk about version control. Version control, which uh, comes in a, a very various flavors, and the one that Drupal uses is Git. The purpose of version control is to keep track of changes in files between, between various submissions of a module or a theme or some other code to the Drupal project. For example, if you are working on a project for a very long time, and at some point you say, hey, wait, actually this worked better two months ago. If your system's in version control, then it's very easy to, to roll back two months ago and see exactly what the code looked like then. So that's the purpose of version control. Now, the, the features of version control, they allow you to revert individual files back to a previous state or an entire project back to a previous state. And as a new person on a project, you can review how, how that project has changed over time. You can see who's made the changes, when the changes were made, and people will leave comments on their changes in the version control system. So Git is the one that's, that's, that's popular now. It's the only one you need to know at the moment. And the easiest way to get started is with some of the clients out there that have user interfaces. So what Git allows you to do from a, a Git client is something you install on your computer that lets you interact with the, uh, the Git repo, which is what's hosted by Drupal.org somewhere else. And what it allows you to do is you can pull down the code you can look at it, you can change it, and you can push your changes up. If someone else makes a change while you're working on something, then you can pull their changes back down. And this is a little jargony to say push, pull, sync, or whatnot. But if you imagine that the, the source of the code is far away, then these, then these words start to make sense. You pull the source of the code to you, and you push your code to it. So. Some other jargon is the word branches, where you can have different versions of a project where you are working on a totally different version of a project while other people are working on their version. And then when you're, when you're all done, you can merge your branches together. That is bring their code in and, bring, and merge it with your code. You can also generate the difference between two sets of code which is which generally comes in the form of a patch. So if I want to compare your code versus my code, I can run a command to generate a patch, which looks like what we saw earlier in the Dreaditor version, the Dreaditor section of the presentation, where we saw lines that were removed from the code and lines that were added to the code. So here's an example of a Git client that has a user interface. 
and it looks like there's there's a lot I mean this there is a lot going on here as far as like the information and you might feel a little overloaded here but but just know that that most of this stuff when you're working practically day to day you're you're not going to really look at you're mainly just going to look at I'm not sure if my mouse is visible but the top right pane here where you can see files that have changed within a specific uh, commit a specific um push to the repo and this client is called smart git and there are a few more let's see is this the same client this looks a little different but as you can see some of the the features of them are the same they'll give you a list of branches which is your version of the code you're working on the commits are the history for the project and then you can see the details for any commit by clicking on it Git clients also have a command line client, which is where you'll open up the terminal on your computer and you'll type a git command, G-I-T something or other. Generally, you'll use those jargony words that we've talked about before, push, pull, commit, which is, is saying, please make a record of these changes, and branching. So here's what a command line git interface might look like. And this will look different depending on how you have your terminal set up. But the commands we're going to be using in this presentation will be traversing a file system, such as CD to change directories. And we'll be using Git specific commands, such as cloning, which is making a copy of a repo, a remote repo on my local computer. And diff, which shows me the difference between changes I have on my local computer and the last recorded instance of the repo. The open command is a Mac command that we'll use to open the finder window in whichever folder we're currently in. Now another, another thing that's worth noting as a developer is the difference between text editors and IDEs. So this is where you'll write your code on your computer while, while working on the project. And just a little note here, I keep using the word code but it could also be documentation. A lot of Drupal's documentation is stored within the Git repos, and so you can begin contributing to Drupal by editing documentation, but you'll still use, you'll use these same tools and techniques. And, and just, I just wanted to throw that out there, because I say the word code a lot, but you could be editing grammar and contributing to Drupal. So let's look at the difference between text editors and IDEs. So text editors are the most common sort of program on any computer. It is some way to edit a text file. Everybody's computer comes with one. Uh, if you're on a Windows machine, this is called Notepad. If you are on a Mac machine, this is called Text Edit, I believe. But this is just, just opening a file, changing the words, saving the file. It, they tend to have some basic functionality such as find and replace. They may try to auto-complete or spell check your stuff, and they can be ext extensible. More recently, there have, been, there have been very extensible text editors that have been created for, for developers. And we're gonna make a distinction here between text editors and IDEs in just a moment when we talk about IDEs. But if you've heard of Sublime or Atom, uh, a T O M. These are text editors that are made for developers, meaning that they primarily don't provide a function beyond basic abilities of modifying the text or the code. Whereas an IDE, an IDE is integrated with the software that you are working on. So if if you're developing for any type of project, this could be C sharp, uh, C++, I mean, anything that's like, that you would consider programming, this could be COBOL, whatever. An IDE is software that's made to edit your code that actually understands the code. So it can tell you if you're doing it right or doing it wrong. Whereas a text editor generally doesn't have that fully integrated sense of what you're working on. It's merely just modifying files. So the value of an IDE is, if you haven't experienced it yourself, it's very, very extreme. <laughs> so not only can you, 
can you easily edit your code just like with a text editor, but it can tell you when you're making mistakes. You can use shortcuts to click on a function or a class or some bits of code and dig into the source. Like where is that function in these thousands of files? Generally you can command click on it and jump straight to that. It can, it can provide to you the documentation for the thing you're working on right away. The features for an IDE are, ex are extremely valuable, and I highly recommend at least trying one out if you are interested in developing with code. The, the ones that come to mind immediately to me are Visual Studio Code, which is a free one produced by Microsoft, and PHP Storm, which is very popular and produced by the JetBrains company. So I've sort of gone through some differences here, but let's just reiterate. Text editors, they don't have as many features, and but they can be customized. So a lot of people that use Atom or Sublime, they have plugins that provide features similar to that of IDEs. Now IDEs, since they're fully integrated, they can be a little slower when you're working with them. Generally, this will not be noticed if you have a modern computer doesn't have to be a crazy good computer, just sort of something with a, a modern amount of RAM, like eight, eight gigabytes ought to do, <laughs> but uh, an IDE can be slower and it can feel a little slower, but you'll make up that time. I, I can't stop recommending it. The IDE learning curve can be a little steep. The way you set up your project in an IDE might require you to look up some documentation. It's not as simple as opening a file. Generally what you'll do is you'll say, all right, I'm gonna set up a new project that is mywebsite.com and you'll point it to your Drupal, Drupal files and then the IDE will consume all that information and learn about your project so that it can help you. So text editors, they definitely have fewer features as far as coding goes um, and they, but they can be really quick. They can tend to be the right job, the right, the right tool for the right job. But if you are really interested in digging into development, I recommend an IDE. Okay, so we're going to do a lightning demo. Um, so what we'll do is we'll dive into the issue queue. We're going to first review an issue um, because that is a more um, an easier task um, than creating a patch. So first we'll review an issue. We'll go into the proje a project, we'll create an issue, we'll fix the problem, we'll create a patch, we'll upload the patch, and we'll change the status of an issue. Now the next slide is a duplicate um, that got in there, but there's one thing I want to explain before going into the demo is the naming convention for a patch. Now right now, if you're not familiar with things, this might be a little bit confusing, but we're gonna use a command called git diff because we're going to be creating a new branch off of an original branch and we're gonna be viewing and creating the differences, a diff between the two of them. And the naming convention for creating a patch is get diff with the original branch name, the new branch name, and then you're going to make a, oh, there's a little line missing there, but you're going to make a patch and it's going to be named the name of the project, a quick description, the issue number, which we'll show you how to do, and the comment number where you're going to post the patch. So again, it's going to be the project name, a quick description, a node number, and the number of the comment where you're going to post the patch. So I just wanted to explain that before we do the process. Okay, so we're going to dive into the issue queue. So the best place to go for the issue queue is drupal.org slash projects slash issues. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be navigating and Jonathan's going to be driving. So, <laughs> so this is the issue queue. 
Um, this is all the projects. This is Contrib and this is Core. There's a lot of different ways you can go through the issue queue. You can search by project, you can search by title, status. What we're gonna do is we're gonna click the created on the left side oh. or on the right side. There's a created tab at the top of the issue queue and we're gonna sort by creation date. Okay, so if we scroll down, I have pre-fabricated an issue for us to go over today, and it's the admin status issue, and we found a typo on the help page. So we're gonna look at this issue. We're gonna see what's involved, and it looks like um, there's a typo on the help page. So there's a couple of ways you can review this, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin it up on Simply Test Me, and we're gonna spin it up on Simply Test Me before the patch is applied. So if we navigate to simply test me, not, uh, not that, just no. the regular simply test dot me. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna put what we talked about to use. We're gonna enter the project name, which is admin status. and you click the module, and then on the side there, we're gonna pick the version number. And typically when you look and evaluate projects, you wanna do the most recent branch, and for this one, it's the 8x.1x branch at the bottom. And then we're just gonna click the sandbox. And what this does is in a couple of minutes, we'll have a site ready to go with the admin status module enabled. So it's just gonna hang out here and do its stuff. And I do want to mention a few things about Simply Test Me. Um, it is a great resource to lower the entry, the barrier to entry, um, but it has some difficulties right now. Recently it was taken over by somebody else and there's some kinks that happen from time to time. So just be aware that because something doesn't work on Simply Test Me, at the moment you're testing it doesn't mean it's not going to work forever. So there's an issue queue that you can dive into for Simply Test Me. There's a Drupal Slack channel that you can go into and ask questions if something isn't working for you. Um, there's just a little bit of um, in between time happening right now. So, and we're also looking for people to help out with some issues too. And we're trying to move the project forward. Um, by adding some new features and a design, we're testing for accessibility. So this is another great project to jump into when you want um, to maybe start contributing. Okay, so we're gonna look at the issue again. And it says, while evaluating the project, I noticed, I noticed a typo on the help page. And it looks like the word information is spelled wrong. And I provided a path to replicate, which is admin, help admin status. So we'll go back to um, our Simply Test Me. We're gonna log in. And with Simply Test Me, the username and password is generally admin admin. Real secure, but easy to remember. So we'll paste that path to replicate in there. So we're on the admin status project page and we can see that that word information is indeed misspelled. So what we'll do is we'll take a screenshot of this as of before, because we're testing the patch. And we'll go back to the issue queue. And now um, we see that a patch has been submitted. So we're gonna click the review button that Dreaditor provided for us. We're gonna review the code. So if we scroll over, we can see that there are no changes except for the word information and everything else looks good. So we'll go back. If we hit cancel, we'll go back and we'll hit simply test me. Next to the patch. Yep. And now you can see that it loaded the name of your project, it loaded the branch that we're testing, 
And if you wanted to, you could add an additional project, which we don't need to do for this, but say there was an issue with the project working with something else. And then it has put in the information of the URL for the patch. So now all we have to do is launch the sandbox. And now it will launch the same project, but with the patch applied. So we're just gonna wait another couple minutes for it to spin up. And going into the issue queue and looking for issues that need review is a great way to start contributing back to Drupal. You don't necessarily have to um, know code, but you can test the patches. So I think like as a beginner, this is a perfect first step to introducing yourself into the queue. And then you can ask questions in the issue queue. People are very nice. They'll, if you need help replicating an issue, generally maintainers will provide you some steps and um, it can be a friendly place, so don't be scared. While this is starting up, I'm going to show what this looks like without the Dread Editor plugin. So I'm just going to open the same page in a private tab where I'm not logged in. Notice that all the buttons, all those blue buttons, these are all coming from the Dread Editor browser plugin. That's all. <laughs> Just hanging out. Yeah, another, I'll go ahead and rename this. Another thing that happens sometimes with Simply Test Me is some of the parts move faster than another than other parts. And um, when it's done, there'll be a white screen and you'll be scared because it'll say website anticipated or encountered an error. And if you just hit refresh, usually that'll clear up the problem. And in case we haven't mentioned, each of these instances on Simply Test Me live for 24 hours. So the insecurity of admin admin is very limited. It's 12 hours now. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. But um, if you want to share the instance with someone, you can shoot them over the URL if you're working on a project with someone. So that's really handy. So we're going to log in again with admin admin. And we'll go to that um, help page. And we can see that now the word information is spelled right. So what we'll do is we'll take a screenshot of that. And now what you do is you make a comment. So we're going to look at this metadata. We're going to, let's see, there's a status button. Right now it says needs review, but we're going to change that status to reviewed and tested by the community. That's us, the community. Sometimes you'll hear that called RTBC for short. And we're going to make a useful comment about what we did, what, how we tested it. So we'll say something like, well, go ahead, Jonathan. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I tested this patch using Simply Test. And I like to thank people. And then Anything? because it, because it was a user interface, we took a before and after shot, which is really handy. That way the maintainer can look at it and be like, oh, okay, they did test it and it looks good. So you would go down towards the bottom and there's a place where you can add some files and you'll just attach both those files. And you do have to do it one at a time. And then I also want to scroll up closer to the, the comment just to add a little bit of useful information. There's a place for attribution and um, you can scroll up a little bit more. It says here, attribute this contribution. Now, Jonathan is saying he's volunteering his own time, but he can click the other box that says his Drupal.org name, 
and he can attribute his employer if he wanted to. So if he hits that not applicable button next to organization, it'll show what organizations you have tied to your Drupal.org profile. So say you're on company time, this is the way that you would give your company attribution for helping out. So, so we're done here. It looks like we uploaded the screenshots, we made a useful comment, and now all we have to do is save. Okay, do you like to embed the screenshots using Dreaditor or just leave them there? I don't, but that's up okay. to people. Sounds good, all right. And now if you scroll up, you see that we've changed the status of the issue from needs review, which was yellow, into RTBC, which is green. So perfect first step. Okay, we're going a little short on time, so this next one's gonna be a little bit quick, but we'll have notes that we'll share with people on the documentation of all the steps that we do. So now we're going to go back to that original instance of admin status that we spun up on Simply Test Me, the first one. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the extend page. And if you scroll down and find admin status, okay, so there is a new coding standard in Drupal 8 where the names of the module should be capitalized. So it looks like the name of the module is not capitalized in this sense. And you can, some people can argue that it is capitalized, it's just not in title case, but if you look at the rest of the projects in core, everything's in title case. So we're going to make this UI change and capitalize the name of the module. So first step is we're going to go back to the original project page for admin status. We're going to scroll down towards the bottom of the page and we're gonna look at the code repository under the development section on the right. And what this does is it allows you to look at the repository before downloading it on your machine. So we go to the tree. We make sure that we're on the 8.1 branch and we are. And this is in the info file. So we'll click on the info YAML file. And as you can see, admin status is not capitalized. So we're gonna fix that. So if we go back to the project page, scroll up to the top and there's a tab called version control. And it takes you to a page where you can get a command to download the version onto your computer. So there's a drop down there that allows you to pick which branch you want to select. Um, if you're more advanced users, you know that if you download the project, you get all the branches. But as a beginner, let's just download the branch we want. So under one time only, there's a setting up your repository for the first time. So you're just going to grab that command. You're going to open a terminal. You are going to navigate to where you want to put that project. So Jonathan's going to put it on his desktop. So then he's going to paste that command and it's going to grab that whole repository from drupal.org. And now what we want to do is we want to go into that project because we're going to work on it. So you use the CD command, which is change directories. And we're going to do PWD just to make sure we're in the right place, which is desktop admin status. Okay, so now here's one of those tricks. If you do open space period, it will open the project in your finder window and you can drag that folder into your text editor. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't see that step coming. Um, oh, okay. Let's do here. What I can do is I can just click on the file and that'll open in my text editor. Sure. All right. Sorry. And this is a text editor, not an IDE. It's not going to do anything special for me. Okay. So we can see that there's a mistake. So what we want to do now is we want to create an issue. So we'll go back to the project page. Um, if you go down on the right, there's a issues for admin status. And if you click on all issues, that will open up your issue queue. 
And normally you would search for the issue, but this is a practice module. So this has been fixed and um, broken several times, but normally you would make sure that the issue doesn't already exist. So we're gonna create a new issue and we'll name it something succinct, like capitalize the name of the module on the project page or something like that. Um, we're gonna look at this metadata category. Now there's bug report, task, feature request. This is a task. The priority on anything that isn't quite a bug, I always put as minor, but if it's a showstopper, I'll put critical. We're gonna leave the status as active. We're going to change the version to eight dev because we want to work on the most current branch. And the component is a little tricky on this one. It's code, it's documentation, and it's user interface. So you can pick whatever you want, Jonathan. Let's do code, that okay. sounds fancy. And since Jonathan's planning on working on it right now, he's gonna assign it to himself. Now, if All you right. wanted to, you could um, tag it with novice or something like that, but we don't need to do that today. Um, then we're going to write a summary of what we're gonna do. So what I like to do is I like to provide a link to any sort of documentation if it's a coding standard. So, you know, Jonathan has, we, we pre-populated this, but you know, he says when evaluating the project, he noticed the project was not capitalized on the extend page. He provided a link to the documentation. He, re he provided a path to replicate and he's gonna patch it. So if he scrolls down, he can hit save. And what this does is it creates a unique node on drupal.org. There's that node number we were talking about when naming our patches. So he's gonna snag that node number and he's gonna go back to his text. No, he's gonna go back to either his terminal or his get client, whatever he wants to use, and he's going to create a new branch to work on. All right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just keep going in the terminal for now. Okay. And there are, in our documentation notes, there's documentation on how to do it both ways. So, and normally what I do, and maybe Jonathan does it a little differently, I name my branch the node number and the comment number I'm anticipating applying the patch, which hopefully is number two. <laughs> right, unless someone else is real quick, it'll be number two. <laughs> you can always go back and change it. So he creates a new branch, he checks it out, he's working on that branch, so he's gonna go into his text editor and he's going to make the changes appropriate for this patch. All right, and just to clarify the command I did here is just your common, it's a common Git command, you check out and dash B means create a new branch. So I'm copying the branch I'm currently on to a new branch named whatever I chose to name it. So he's gonna make this change. And he's gonna save it. So now when he goes back to the terminal, he's gonna do like, let's say a get status to see what he did you know, he changed that, so he's going to add the change, get add period, or however he does it, or next he'll commit the change. So no one will ever see this commit message, but it's always good to be consistent with writing good commit messages. Ooh, typo there. <laughs> Let's go there. Does this meet the standard for a good commit message? Yes. All right. And now what he wants to do is he wants to create a patch, which is a difference between the two branches. So when we think back, we have the command git diff, and we're going to compare the two branches, which is git diff, and the first branch was 8.x-1.x, I believe, and then a Yep. Space, and you're going to do the second branch name, which is that node number and the comment number. And he's going to pipe that 
or create it using the carrot and then our naming convention, which is the name of the project admin status dash sort to short description of the change, which is capitalized. And then your node number and your anticipated comment number. Dot patch. Dot patch. Let's get all that on one line. And, so all right. He has a patch. So now he's going to go back to the issue queue and provide a patch for the world. So let's see, we're going to change the metadata. We're going to look at the status. And since we're, we're um, submitting a patch, we're going to ask people to review it. He's going to unassign himself so people know that he's not actively working on it. He's going to make a useful comment, something polite. You know, I, I uploaded a patch, whatever. And then he's going to scroll down and very much like how we added the screenshots, he's going to attach his patch. And then hit save. All right, here goes. <laughs> and now in theory, well, there it is. There's the patch. He can hit the review button so he can see if his changes are there. Looks good. And then someone's going to come up next and review it. He, they're going to hit the simply test me button. They're going to spin it up and they're going to see that the changes took place. Now, we don't review our own patches. That's left for someone else. So, um, so this is there for the universe to, to review. And that's a quick and dirty way of starting out in the issue queue. We don't have a lot of time for questions, but does anyone have any questions? If not, I, I would like to show something, but feel free to interrupt me with a question. What I'm gonna do is show a graphic user interface for Git. Because what I did with the command line can seem a bit intimidating, or at least I know it was for me. So the graphic user interface, I'm using a source tree. And the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an existing local repository, which is I did a checkout of the admin status. So I'm just going to open that checkout in this user interface. We can actually look at the work I did in a more friendly way. So here I have a list of branches on the left. If I double click on this branch, I'm back to the 8x, 1x. And, um, and so I should see that my, my file has changed back to being not correct. See, the S in admin status is now lowercase again. I'm going to delete this patch because it's a little confusing right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to make that change again just to show what it looks like in the in this user interface. Yeah, save anyway. I'm not sure what Text Wrangler is asking me there. But so here I've made a change in the repo or in my local checkout of the repo. And in this interface in source tree, I can click this top level line, which is uncommitted changes, and I can see a list of files that were changed and what changes were made. From here, I can choose to add them, uh, add the file. This is the same thing I did. This little checkbox I did right there is the same as the command I made before when I did git add dot. So that's the git add command. And now if I click the commit button at the top, this is the git commit command. And I can just say, capitalize the module name. And so a uh, user interface can be really useful. I personally use both a git user interface, source tree, and the command line, just sort of depending on my mood. But I recommend having a user interface available. I'm gonna cancel out of this commit.
but I just wanted to show that. Any questions come up during that? <laughs> if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask directly, or you can throw something into the chat box. Last chance. Okay, well, it appears we don't have any uh, additional questions at this time. So Amy, June, and Jonathan, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, for our attendees, we will have a recording of this session available to you on our uh, Drupal for Gov playlist, our webinars playlist. Anyone that registered for this event through Eventbrite will receive a follow on email, which will include the link um, to our uh, to the recording, as well as uh, a very short, I promise it's short, uh, quick survey to let us know what you thought about today's webinar, uh, but also then to give us uh, an opportunity to collect your input on uh, webinars you'd like to see in 2019. We'd like to try to really build out a robust schedule, so we, uh, we look forward to your input. So, and again, Jonathan, Amy June, thanks very much. We really appreciate it, and uh, maybe we'll have you back in 2019. All right, thank you very much.